Well, good evening, everyone. It's good to see each and every one of you. If you're visiting with us, we're certainly glad that we've come our way. I know I look back and see Jeff. We're glad that he's been here and has some safe travels to be with us, but thankful for all our visitors that are here this evening. Uh, We're going to be looking at the book of Zephaniah. If you'll turn your Bibles over there uh, in the Old Testament, Zephaniah. We've been doing a book of the month. Last uh, month, we looked at Habakkuk. And actually, to get to Zephaniah, we're actually going back in history. Those minor prophets are not necessarily put in historical order. So trying to get into our timeline, we looked at Habakkuk last, and Habakkuk is kind of standing there at the end of the uh, southern kingdom Judah, and God basically tells him that the Babylonian army is coming. And uh, certainly we see his faith as, and his stand that really he takes, and he says, I- I'm going to be faithful uh, no matter what the circumstances are thrown my way. Zephaniah, we're actually rewinding in time in the southern kingdom. We know that we have a united kingdom with Saul, David, Solomon. The kingdom is going to split in half. We're going to have the northern kingdom, Israel, the southern kingdom, Judah. Northern kingdom will be taken out by Assyria, and there are many prophets that work on the northern kingdom, Israel, the ten tribes. The southern kingdom, Judah, is going to have some good kings. And in Zephaniah's time, we're really at the last period of restoration. We're going to see in verse 1 of Zephaniah uh, some of the people that he associates himself with, but uh, one of the people he associates himself with is King Josiah. Remember, Josiah is really the last restorer of that southern kingdom, the last one that really tries to turn it back. Remember, he becomes king at a young age. He finds the book of the law, and he reads it, and he tears his clothes, and he's really like, my dad didn't really follow this. My grandpa didn't really follow this, although there was some turning later in life. But he says, really, i got to go back to King Hezekiah. You know, Zephaniah and Josiah, Josiah is going to be a king, and Zephaniah is going to be a prophet, a minor prophet in this thing. Uh, where really, we look at his background, we would associate him actually more as an aristocrat or maybe a wealthy, kind of powerful person during this time. But uh, I believe they're cousins as we track back their history. He basically says, my great-great-grandfather was King Hezekiah. Well, that's also in Josiah's line. So Zephaniah, who we're listening to here, and Josiah the king, they're actually related. And these two guys, uh, you could consider them perhaps a team of sorts, uh, And we see that really throughout the Bible is there's a lot of people that are actually working for the Lord, even though sometimes it seems like we are few, but uh, sometimes uh, there are multiple people working for the Lord. They're working in different situations in different places. Uh, Sometimes they have different occupations. If we remember, we studied Amos, and Amos kind of had that herdsman background. Now Amos, he went to the northern kingdom, and he was kind of like a farmer. He said, you cows of Bashan, and he really went at the capital city of the north, Well, now we have Zephaniah. He's actually working on the capital city of the south. And this is many years later, of course. But you think about that. you got Amos, kind of this farmer and this herdsman, trying to do God's work. And you got Zephaniah, which I really believe Zephaniah's background is an aristocrat, wealthy, a powerful person. Those are really two different demographics. But God works with people with different backgrounds, different occupations. Anyone that's willing to serve the Lord, the Lord will take. Many times there are not many wealthy and mighty in and, and, and terms of worldly things, but when we look at Zephaniah, when we look at his heritage, we look where he's preaching, he's preaching, he's working in the uh, capital of the south. He's working in Jerusalem. And I think he has a wealthy background, an aristocrat background, and we're going to see that he is going to be working on this capital city of the southern kingdom. This is going to be the last period of major restoration before the Babylonian army comes. Zephaniah is going to try to work hard to sway the capital city of Jerusalem that is turning away from God to turn back to God. And I think him and Josiah, I think they work hard together, although we don't know exactly where those connections are. Was Zephaniah slightly before? Were they both working during? They're at the same time period, and I I like to think that they're working to some degree hand in hand trying to turn the people back. This month we're going to be looking at Zephaniah. A man that I believe had some wealth in his background, had some uh, king lineage in his background, and he is going to be working on the capital city of the south as they're turning away from God, and he's going to be pleading with them to turn back to God so this punishment that's going to be coming, we know from Babylon, perhaps can be turned back, perhaps can be delayed to some degree. But in the chapter 1, once we get down to verse 4, we see that there is a great day of the Lord that's coming. There's a punishment. There's this day of judgment that is coming. And when we look at verses 4 through 6, 
Zephaniah, I think, is going to show us four groups of people that will be lost. And although I understand that this is the Old Testament, I think we have these four groups of people walking among us that will be lost because of their conduct and things that they're involved in and not turning to the Lord. He's going to classify four groups of people in the capital city of Jerusalem, which is really sad. This is supposed to be God's people. This is supposed to be God's nation. This is supposed to be God's capital city. I mean, this is Jerusalem. And yet, the people are turning away from God left and right. In verses 4 through 6, we're going to see four groups of people. And I think Zephaniah says these people need to be watching out for the judgment. Because the judgment, he's talking about Babylon, this judgment is coming. And he said it is not going to be good for these groups of people. Let's start looking at the text. Zephaniah kind of introduces himself, verse 1. We start to see this idea of judgment coming. Verses 4 through 6 is where we're going to focus tonight. Verses 4 through 6, we're going to find four groups of people that will be lost. Number one, it says, I stretch out my hand against Judah and against the inhabitants of Jerusalem. I will cut off every trace of Baal from this place. Number one, we see that Zephaniah is saying that there is a lot of Baal worship happening in Jerusalem, happening in Judah, the the place that's supposed to be God's people. Uh, But number one is people will be lost because they follow false gods. There is Baal worship going on in Jerusalem, and we see, it says, I stretch out my hand against Judah. That's that southern kingdom. It says, against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. That's the capital city. And he says, I will cut off every trace of Baal from this place. The implication is, is that in Jerusalem, in the holy city, we have these individuals who are involved in Baal worship. You know one way to be lost? Follow a false god. And I think that applies to individuals today, individuals that get following false gods, following Baals, following uh, other religions and other things. They need to watch out for the day of judgment. We see this idea of God, you know, being shown stretching out his hand against Judah because there's Baal worship in the holy city of Jerusalem. There are false gods, there are false religions, and certainly the Bible warns about this. When it comes to the New Testament, we cannot follow a different gospel. And we cannot follow a different Lord. The Bible cuts down our options and says there's one God to follow, and yet our world and the religious world we live in today and our society, it's almost like they say anything goes. And we're going to see that usually once people start going away from certainly the God of the Bible, what they start to do is they try to do something sly and mix religions. And we're going to see that that's the second group Zephaniah is going to call out. He says, one, there's people following false gods. Number two, you guys are trying to mix religion. And you know what? We've got a lot of people in our country that are trying to mix religion. Let's take a little Judaism. Let's take a little Christianity. Let's take a little Islam. Let's take a little Christianity. Let's take a little bit of everything, mix it together. You're okay. I'm okay. It really doesn't matter. But you want to be lost? Follow a false god. Follow a different gospel. I remember what Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. He says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you who want to pervert the gospel of Christ. For even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than that which we have preached, let them be accursed. Now I've said before, let me say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel than that which you have received, let him be accursed. We can't follow a different gospel. We can't follow a different God. I mean, Jesus couldn't be any more clear. John 14 and verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me or through me. We think of Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. No, we cannot replace God with some false God. We cannot replace the true gospel with a false gospel. Zephaniah is saying the capital city, they need to watch out. Because the judgment day, this day when the Babylons come, those people that follow false gods, it is going to be a bad day for those that follow false gods. He doesn't stop there. Let's continue in the text of verses 4 and 5. We'll start in verse 4. It says, I stretch out my hand against Judah and against the inhabitants of Jerusalem. I will cut off every trace of Baal from this place. Okay? False gods. The names of the idolatrous priests with the pagan priests, those who worship the hosts of heavens on housetops, those who worship and swear oaths by the Lord, but who also swear by Milcom. 
You know, in those next few verses, I think we see a picture, and we really see a picture, I believe, of individuals that are not being faithful, and also a picture of people that are trying to mix religion. Number one, false gods, they're a problem. You'll be lost if you follow false gods. Number two, if you start to try to mix religion. These individuals were trying to mix religion. There's actually two groups of priests in verse 4. It says the names of the adulterous priests with the pagan priests. There are two groups of priests mentioned here. We have pagan priests... I think really associated with false gods. I think the adulterous priest is actually talking about individuals that could even be from the Levitical priesthood, but yet they are not being faithful to God and they're not doing the things that they're doing. You know, there's just out there, there's false teachers, but you know what? There can even be individuals within the brotherhood that actually cannot be faithful. The mixing of religion is a problem, and we see it here in the capital city of the south, in Jerusalem. You know, you think about that. What would a nation look like before they fall? Number one, they're going to fall to some false gods. That's what's happening with Judah. They're falling false gods. Number two is they're mixing religion. We've got people that are supposed to be faithful that are really cheating on God, and we've got the false pagan priests. Both of these are going to be put in the group that are going to be punished. And we continue on. It says, those who worship the hosts of heaven on the housetops. These individuals are worshiping the stars. You know, it's kind of interesting sometimes what people get involved in, but there's some people that put a lot of stock in those horoscopes. A lot of stock in those horoscopes. You know what? In the Old Testament, in Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 19, if I'm not mistaken, it says, And take heed, lest you lift your eyes to heaven, and when you see the sun, the moon, the stars, all the hosts of heaven, you feel driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord your God has given to all the peoples under the whole heaven as a heritage. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, it says, Why are you worshiping the stars? Why are you worshiping the moon? Why are you worshiping these things? God gave you these things. Why would you worship them? And we've got a lot of people, they put a lot of stock in those horoscopes. They need to put stock in God's word. These people are mixing religion. We'll take a little of this. We'll take a little of that. We'll worship God, but we'll also worship the stars. We'll do this. We'll do that. They're mixing all kinds of stuff, and it's causing all kinds of problems. God says when this day of judgment comes, the adulterous priests are in trouble. The pagan priests are in trouble. Those who worship the stars, those who are mixing religion and say we're going to take a little of this and we're going to take a little of that, they're going to be in trouble. There's a way to be lost, and it's mixing religion. You know, going back to that idea really quickly, is that I think some of these, when it says adulterous priests, I think this is actually probably talking about the Levitical priesthood, but they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. And and I I, kind of gave this idea that under the New Testament, we could kind of apply the idea this could be a Christian not doing what they're supposed to be doing. This could be a member of the Lord's church that's preaching and they're not preaching like they should. Now some people are like, well, maybe we shouldn't preach. Now now I I do think about that from time to time is that uh, there is certain uh, scriptures that certainly lead us to the idea that those that are teachers need to be very mindful of what they're doing. And I think that's very true. And we can see that certainly throughout the Bible, and we see it in the book of James. It talks about not many of you become teachers. That is something that should be sobering, but I think some of our brethren have made a far greater mistake, is that they say, you know what, I'm going to be safe, and I'm not going to teach the Word. Because I don't want to have a harder judgment on me, so I'm not going to preach the Word. Well, now you're in violation of Matthew chapter 25 in the parable of the talents, Because now you're looking at this idea, you know what, I I might have the talent to teach, but you know what, I'm not going to do it because because there's going to be a harsher judgment for those that are teachers, and and because of that, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to play it safe. Well, you know what, someone played it safe in Matthew chapter 25, and we see what happened. I'm not saying there's not some serious consideration and serious prayer and serious study. We need to rightly divide God's word, but sometimes I think we fall into horrible mistakes. Yes, Not many should be teachers. But does that mean no one becomes a teacher? Because we're going to play it safe? Are we using our talents? We mix religion, we're going to have some problems. 
and we see these individuals are mixing religion. They're serving the creation and not the creator. We see that in Romans chapter 1, verses 24 and 25, this idea that, oh yeah, we're going to worship the creation, but not the creator. These people are going to worship the stars, but not the one that made the stars. We've got this mixing of religion. We've just got a mess. And you know what's sad is a lot of times when people get lost in this mixed religion uh, around us, as many times they think they're okay. In Jeremiah chapter 7, I think we ha- find some people that are out of touch. In Matthew, uh, Jeremiah rather, chapter 7, verses 9 and 10, the Bible says this. It says, Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, burn incense to Baal, and walk after other gods whom you do not know, and then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, We are delivered to do all these abominations. And Jeremiah, the people are saying, oh, we can do this, we can do this, we can do this. And then they're going to the house of worship and saying, we're okay with God. Some people are blinded by mixed religion. You know why? Because mixed religion says this is okay, that's okay, everything's okay. And you know what? The God of the Bible is not okay with everything. The God of the Bible is not okay with mixed religion. He's not okay with mixed worship. I think of Matthew chapter uh, uh, 5 rather 15, Matthew chapter 15, verses 8 and 9, Jesus there is speaking, he says, hypocrites. Well, why are they hypocrites? Why are they pretenders? He says, hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you. These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrine the commandments of men. What are they doing? They're taking the commandments of men and saying, you know what, these commandments of men are more important than God. We're just going to do what men say. And God says that worship is vain. And we really see worship go wrong all throughout the Bible. And it's amazing that people in our world, in the religious world, say worship can't go wrong. What are you talking about? In Genesis, we see worship get messed up with Cain and Abel. We see worship get messed up with the golden calf. We see worship get messed up in the northern and southern kingdom, where we see them make golden calves in the northern kingdom. Uh, In Amos chapter 5, the people think they're good. They say, we can't wait on the day of the Lord. And Amos tells them in Amos chapter 5, he says, you don't want the day of the Lord to come. It will be a day of darkness and not light. These people are saying, oh, we can't wait for the day of the Lord to come. And Amos says, you are not ready for the day of the Lord to come. It's going to be a day of darkness and not light. And actually, in Amos chapter 5, he tells them, I despise your feast days, I despise what you're doing, and I'm not going to hear your worship anymore. Worship can go wrong. And one of the ways worship can go wrong real quick is when we start to mix religion. We're going to start taking what men say, not what the Bible says, and we're just going to make up what we want. We said that Zephaniah and Josiah are working at the same time. When Josiah gets his hands on the book of the law and he reads it and he tears his clothes, the Bible records some of the things he tries to do. In 2 Kings chapter 23 and verse 5, this is some of the reforms that Josiah starts to do and it really matches up with chapter 1 here. In 2 Kings chapter 23 and verse 5 it says, Then he removed the idolatrous priest. Wait, Zephaniah just said idolatrous priest. Zephaniah said, adulterous priests, you're in trouble. And you know what uh, Josiah does? He says, these adulterous priests, we're getting out of here. In in 2 Kings chapter uh, 23 and verse 5, it says, Then he removed the adulterous priests whom the kings of Judah had ordained to burn incense on the high places in the cities of Judah and in the places all around Jerusalem and those who burned incense to Baal, to the sun, to the moon, to the constellations, to all the hosts of heaven. 2 Kings chapter 23 and verse 5 matches right up with Zephaniah. Zephaniah says, I know what's going on in the capital city. You're fallen false gods, you're mixing religion. And when Josiah starts doing reforms, that's exactly what he goes after. I think sometimes we miss this in the Lord's church. Is that evil just doesn't go away. It takes some force, it takes some effort. We have Zephaniah saying, we've got some mixed religion here. And Josiah goes, you know what, we've got some mixed religion here. And then they start making a move and they say, we're going to get this stuff out of here. But I think the Lord's church thinks we can take a passive approach in this battle that we're in and not understand that the battle that we're in is going to take effort and it is going to take some work. You think the false religion is just going to get out of the United States? You think the false priests are just going to leave? They're not going to leave without a fight. And I'm not talking about a physical fight. I'm talking about 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. 
2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. It says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapon of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. The war that we're in is spiritual. And people think that we, cannot ha- we, can, uh, we can make change in the world without having a religious conversation. That we can make change in the world without trying to talk to our neighbors. That we can make change in our world. We, we have to get out there and spread the gospel. And if we don't, we will lose the spiritual war. At least in the area in which we live. Number one, you'll be lost if you follow false gods. Number two, you'll be lost if you get involved in mixed religion. Number three, let's look at Zephaniah in verse six. It says, those who have turned back from following the Lord. Now there are many religious groups that that say once saved, always saved, and you know, just all this all this nonsense. I mean, I, I just don't know how to Really, you just read the Bible, you go through the New Testament, you go through the letters. If you come away with one saved, always saved, I don't know what you're looking at. Now certainly we understand God's grace, we understand faithfulness, we understand these ideas. But right here in verse 6, what does it say? Watch out for the judgment that's coming. Those who have turned back from following the Lord. Is it possible to follow the Lord for a time and then turn back? I believe it is. I think 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 20 through 22 would definitely give us a picture of that. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 20 through 22. It says, For if, after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, and the latter end is worse for them than the beginning, for it would have been better for them to have not known the way of righteousness than to having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them, But it has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit and a sow having washed to wallowing in the mire. It's possible to turn your back on God and reject him and say, you know what, I don't believe in God. I'm not going to attempt to follow God. I am not going to do anything in respect to trying to be faithful to the Lord. You want to be lost? Turn back from following the Lord. Certainly we see a picture in the prodigal son. Certainly we see a picture in James chapter 5 where it says, Brethren, if anyone among you wonders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save a soul from death. Number one, follow a false god. Number two, mix religion. Number three, turn back from following the Lord. Number four, verse six, It says, and have not sought the Lord, nor inquired of him. You know, you can be lost because you don't inquire the Lord and you don't seek the Lord. And many times, I think individuals don't like to talk about this topic, but I think certainly it is a biblical topic, is that God has given us enough evidence to come to a conclusion that there is a God and that that God is worth coming to a conclusion of serving that God. I think of Romans chapter 1 and verse 20. Since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Ignorance is not an excuse. Those that don't seek the Lord, that don't seek his way, they're in trouble. Acts chapter 17 and verse 30. It says, For, uh, though this time, Therefore this time of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Ignorance, not seeking the Lord, that's a way to be lost. And there is no excuse for not seeking the Lord. Not seeking the Lord and His ways. And I think many people are disinterested. They don't want to do what Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 through 8, where it talks about asking, seeking. People don't want to get engaged in that. People don't want to ask any religious questions. They don't want to seek. They don't want to knock. They don't want to take any actions. And you know what? Judgment is coming. People will be lost. People will be lost because they follow a false god. People will be lost because they mix religion. People will be lost because they turn back from following the Lord. People will be lost because they do not seek the Lord. Certainly we don't want you to be in that state this evening. 
We see the pattern in the New Testament of individuals hearing the word, believing, repenting, confessing, being baptized, and certainly living a faithful life in service to the Lord. Not a perfect life, but a faithful life. Perhaps you are subject to the invitation. Perhaps you need the prayers of the church. We'd love to help you in any way if you come as we stand and as we sing.